Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another live session with Emirates MBD. We hope you're all staying safe and sound, and most importantly, socially responsible. So about a few weeks ago, we hosted our first session on career management that's led by Shane Phillips, who's the CEO of the management consultancy, The Phillips Group. So Shane is also the author of the book, Find Your Dream Job, and he's previously hosted a TV show and a live radio show called I on Dubai, uh, I on Careers on Dubai I 103.8. So the first two episodes we hosted earlier were all about finding your vision and how to work around your energy and your motivation and how important it is for you to set these right in order for you to build the brand and the job that you want. So if you didn't have a chance to view that, you can always see those two episodes on our IGTV. So today, Jane, uh, Shane joins me again for the third episode, where we're going to be talking about the third step in the career management. So Shane, without further ado, I leave the floor open to you so you can take our viewers on what the topic is for today. Sure. Today's topic is uh, how do you get a meeting? And at the crux of that is really, you know, having a power network. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can show us this slide number two, a classic dialogue that would happen is, you know, somebody calls up a business unit head or someone who's running a business. And uh, no, I don't know if that's the, uh, I don't know if you can, I think that's slide number four, the first slide after the title page, Never mind. anyway. If you can, it's, it's just the dialogue, the typical dot. Yeah, so the next slide after that one. There we go. So this is a pretty uh, typical dialogue where someone calls in and says, hey, um, this is Tala. I really love a job in marketing. I wanted to send you my CV. Maybe I can come by and have a coffee with you and talk about my career. Now, maybe you personally, because you're a very sweet person, you might entertain them and say, you know what, fine, come in, let's have a coffee. Or you might be too busy and you might say, you know, um, sure, send me your CV. I'll send it over to our HR, and we have a uh, we have an HR business partner for marketing who will process all the applications, and we'll get back to you. We look forward to receiving your thing. And then what happens is that CV is is sent to the HR business partner, and then it's put into a database. And out of that database, out of a thousand people that apply, the top five or top ten are are chosen. And so. It, it, it really can be daunting. So if you don't want, so how do you stop yourself from heading into or falling into that trap? And so this dialogue is pretty much a dead end. So if you call up a business head and say, I'm looking for a job, can I come and talk to you about my career? We've all been there, we've all known what happens. And they say, no, because they have other fires to fight, especially in this really unique situation that we're all in today. There is a lot of fires to fight. So what is the alternative? And uh, um, you know, part of it is kind of staying away from, hey, I'm looking for a job. Can I come and talk about my career? And the other part of the question that we have to ask ourselves, who are the people who are able to get meetings? And who are the people who are really short-circuiting this program? You know, for example, there are certain people who don't, who won't apply online, who won't send their CV to HR, but they'll be ushered in for a meeting with the CEO or the business unit. And who is that person? And do you want to become that person? And if you want to become that person, what is it that the person has that you don't have? These are the questions that I need to ask. So basically, it's a, it's a decision maker at the end of the day. You need to target that person. Yeah. And I think the broad-based piece of it is... You know, who are those people that have that uh, carte blanche to, to short circuit the system? And it's those people that have a power network. And we always have heard this term, power network. We're never taught how to build one. Some people naturally build power networks. They're just genetically, biologically programmed to do that. Other mm -hmm. people are biologically programmed to isolate and to, you know, there are certain people who if they don't see another human being for the next three months, then it's bliss for them. You know, they're introverted people. They do not want to network. They don't want to hang out with you. They don't yeah. want to go to the birthday party. So for those people, you have to make an effort if you want to manage your career. You may not 
You may not want to hang out with other people, but you want to make more money. So it really comes down to how do we create a power network? And if I could just show uh, page five, uh, which would be, I believe it's page five. Yeah. So the question then uh, that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, where does power exist and how do we access this power network? And power exists in uh, people. That's where the power is. It's in people. It's in a very limited number of people. And the more relationships you have with those people, the easier your career is going to be. And so certain people, um, you know, like myself, you could call up a chairman and get a meeting because the person knows you, you have that relationship. Mm -hmm. You don't have a relationships in the market. You're going to struggle. So the first thing that you'd have to say, you have to make a decision. Here's your, here's your, here's your crossroad. Do you want to keep doing what you're doing? Do you want to continue to apply to online jobs and uh, meet with headhunters and not get meetings or call up business unit heads and get pushed down into the database? If that's what you want to do, go ahead. That's what 99% of people are going to be doing. If you say, well, wait a second, maybe Shane's right. Maybe I should create a power network. Then we then 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 let's continue down this road, and then the question becomes, you know, I agree. People, you know, if Brad Pitt needs a job, he picks up the phone. He can get a meeting with 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 the who's who of whoever. He's got a power network. He's a powerful person. Other powerful people want to interact with. Do you want to start to have that kind of power? Do you so then let's make a power network. That's a decision that has to be made. Then. Mm -hmm. Then we can start saying, okay, well, what's the what what do I actually do to build a power now? Yeah. And, and so that's, for, yep. for our joiners, just to recap for our joiners who just joined in, today we're talking about how we can actually get a meeting uh, as part of the career management uh, topic that we're talking about today. But most people, we're in the discussion of talking about power, but most people, when they approach companies, they actually target possibly the wrong people and they think they're never going to get an interview. So essentially, what is the bottom line to how can I get to a person with a decision making characteristics or a person with that carte blanche like you just mentioned? How can I identify that this person is a person that's going to get me at least, you know, the first gateway to a meeting? Right. And so, um, so let's just, so the first step then is saying, okay, I agree. I need a power network in order to have this happen. I want to create one. What's the first step in creating a power network? Mm -hmm. And uh, the first step is understanding where power sits, power sits in people. And then the question is, who are those people? And so if, for example, we just took, um, you know, obviously you're happy where you are. You're not looking for a job, but we just said marketing in banking. So if I wanted to become a chief marketing officer in banking, for example, then I then very quickly you would start to say, OK, who are the top chief marketing officers in the Middle East? And very quickly we start to realize there's 54 banks in the UAE. So there's only 54 possible CMOs. Some banks actually don't have CMOs. They have head of investor relations instead of the marketing title uh, because they're too small. They're not everyone's as huge and successful as Emirates MBD. So there's so they don't have fully fledged marketing departments. And then in Bahrain, you have X number. In Saudi, you have eight banks plus 20 foreign banks, et cetera. So you very quickly, you, you start to arrive at a number around 200. Mm -hmm. And And this is the part that I don't understand when I deal with people who are looking for a job. You need to define your employer universe. Who are your possible employers? There's only 200 possible banks. Now, if we assume, which we already added the caveat, not everyone has a CMO, but let's just assume that they all have a CMO just to make the numbers simple. Yeah. Then you have 200 CMO jobs open. Now, we know that there's a natural attrition rate that 15% of people are either retiring, they going on maternity leave, they're repatriating, they've decided that, you know, I'm going to go sail around the world or I'm going to go 
you know, become a dog trainer in the Himalayas. Like they want to, you know, whatever they're going to do, 15% of people are leaving their job. So we know as soon as we do this, even with a small sample size of 200, we know right away that 15%, which means that there's 30 open jobs, mm -hmm. even in a crisis, because the jobs don't disappear because, you know, the, 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 the bank still needs a marketing function. So because there's a crisis, like, oh, there's no jobs. That's not true. There's 30 available jobs and uh, statistically from a mathematical perspective, there's 30 available marketing jobs right now. Those jobs will not be advertised. Yeah. Those jobs are not advertised. Especially now, the guys, the people are going to be hiring through their networks. They're going to be hiring internally. They're going to start looking, hey, is there somebody, you know, in investor relations we can move if there's an opening? So it's not going to be, uh, hey, we're making a public service announcement that we're hiring for this marketing role. Because the other thing is, is that they're going to get flooded with 5,000, 10,000 applications. So a lot of these jobs will open and, and close without anybody knowing. And you find out after the fact. That's also happened. You find, oh, I didn't know you were, oh, and the jobs closed already. Mm, exactly. So this is the crux of the power network is that you need, and I don't understand, maybe you can explain to me, why would you not make that list? Why would you not take time and just write out the 200 banks and write out who the chief marketing officers are? So I'll ask you a question related to this. And you know, a lot of people, for example, let's say, let's take an, uh, someone who's at an entry level. Do you think that this, framework would apply to them? How would they use them? Or can you give us an example of someone who could be quite junior, but they could apply it to, you know, their own um, uh, path to finding their, to, to basically increasing their career ladder or getting up the career ladder? How can that thank happen? You. Thank you. Thank you for this question. <laughs> because I think it's, it's pretty relevant as well. Because this question. I love this question. Because it's very relevant. And this blows my mind even more because you know, obviously, I'm a one trick pony. I'm the career guy. I just do career stuff. I do it on the radio. I do it on the TV. I do it on in the YouTube. If you go to our yeah. YouTube channel, own my career. This is all I talk. And, and, and it's the same thing all the time where they're saying, Shane, what you're talking about is for senior people. It doesn't work for junior people. Now, let's say I just graduated from uh, American University of Dubai or American University of Sharjah or Zayed University or HCT University, one of the, the amazing, there's so many, by the mm -hmm. way, so many amazing uh, academic institutions in, in UAE that you could get from. So there's a lot of young, talented people coming up and they're excited. And then, so the number one first thing you would do is list out who are the mar chief marketing officers. Number one, if you're junior, you have to do this because that one of your big load stars and keep this with you for the rest of your life. When you're looking for a job, one of the main load stars that you need is, uh, is uh, who's my new boss? Who is my new boss? Right. And so when you make that list of chief marketing officers, you will be naming your new boss. One of those 200 will be your new boss. You don't know that yet, but you need to identify them. And then if you're super junior, please do this. Please do this. Uh, um, if it's my son, he will not be allowed. He'll be stuck in a room with no food and water until he completes this task. Uh, yeah. And which is list out the CMOs and then write out where did they go to school? What is their background? What's their nationality? What's their, where, did, where else have they worked? So what are some of the trends? To when you look at a chief marketing officer for financial services, they're usually always in financial services. Financial services is an industry. It doesn't necessarily like cross-pollination too much. Recently, they're opening up a bit more because of disruption, but generally it's not so much. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you, or if it's automotive or if it's whatever the industry is. Then when I list out their backgrounds and then I want to list out their schools, how mm -hmm. many you, all of a sudden, if you take, for example, uh, American University of Beirut, I would guarantee, I haven't looked at the list, but I will guarantee you at least 
five to 10% of the CMOs are from American University of Beirut. Because, you know, Lebanese and marketing, they, they love, they just go together like peanut butter and jam. You know, there's always going to be, and they're fantastic at it. You know, some of the best marketing people are Lebanese people. They're, they're, they just have a very good eye for this kind of stuff. So, it, so all of a sudden you start to say, oh, hey, uh, you know, like, for example, my, uh, my alum, I'm an alumnus of London Business School. So right away, if I have 200 people and I know that 10 of them are, are my alumnus, I, I immediately have a nexus there. So what's your nexus? What's your relation? And you can call someone up and you can say, hey, I just graduated from LBS or AUB or what Middlesex or, or HCT. And I'm a little bit lost about how to get my career off the ground. Can I please come and have a coffee? With you? Can I just please get 30 minutes of time? Can you give me some advice? Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, your alumni, alumnus, they're always going to take your call. They're always going to meet with you. So if you're super junior, it's 10 times, 10 million times, 10,000%, however you want to say it, way more important that you do it. The more junior you are, the more important it is that you do it. The more senior you are, the more important that you do it because you want to know what your competitors are doing. So if all of a sudden, say I'm the CEO of the bank. Mm -hmm. And I want to know if I'm hiring a CMO, are all my competitors also hiring people who have a master's in marketing? Because now some of the marketing people they're hiring are coming from mathematics because it's all algorithms and how this digital media machine works. Mm -hmm. So what's the profile? I want to have an eye on on my competition. So so from, from a senior perspective, it's executive mindset. It's competitive intelligence 101. Who am I competing against? What are their backgrounds? What kind of talent does my uh, competitor have at the bridge? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like two warships, you know, the the aircraft carrier where the captain sits, it's called the bridge. Who's in the bridge? If uh, if the Americans have one kind of skill set in the bridge and the Chinese have another, now, usually you're going to see them having very similar profiles. So this is this is the most important thing. So if you look at like slide seven, it's really one of the most important things you can do in business. But I assure you, every day of my life, I sit with people who can't find jobs and they refuse to do this basic task. And every day of my life, not every day, but at least a few, t- a few times a week, I mm-hmm. sit with people who are in the top 10% of their profession. And I mean, these are really intelligent, high-performing people. They don't really need to meet with me but I get to meet with them as part of my job. And I can guarantee you that there is not a single person who's in the top 5% of their profession who doesn't have this list done. So that tells you a lot. So let me ask you this. It's interesting you say that because as soon as you tell someone or someone tells you that they're looking for a job, they're immediately going to be telling you, oh, go to the HR person or go to an online job portal and apply there. But now the principles have changed and the way in which you can actually approach a company uh, can be different and can be, can be very different from the traditional ways. So what can you tell candidates there? <laughs> so I think, look, I think we have to be cognizant that as you're saying, yes, it's a digital era and the game has changed. Whereas, you know, you could have applied to a job 15 years ago, and maybe that would work. But today, these digital, the online job space is flooded. So if Emirates MBD, for example, opens a job, I would love to see your numbers. Like I'm sure you guys must have like 2 million applicants a year. I, I don't know if we get HR on the line, but I know that Fly Dubai, for example, Fly Dubai has 2.2 million applicants a year. And that's just Fly Dubai. So imagine a Goldman Sachs or like a Google, it, it, it must be an insane number. So, so you don't, you're going to get washed out in that. Now, when, now you have to realize we're not saying don't apply. You have to spend 5% of your time applying online. But what you're saying now is like, hey, are there other approaches? Now, has the world opened up? So I was just on the call, for example, with somebody who was a graduate of uh, Concordia University in Montreal. I'm Canadian. So I would, you know, hey, bring that up. Hey, I just saw that you're graduate of Concordia. I'm, an, I'm a Canadian in the Middle East as well. 
you know, be great to catch up sometimes. I also saw you're doing some interesting work in the fintech space. Mm -hmm. I'm really doing some cool stuff. This is our dot com startup, you know, and 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 build that peer to peer relationship. Right. And if you're very junior, you have a major advantage because as a junior person, you can say, you know, you can say, hey, I saw you graduated from Concordia and you're working on these two, three really cool fintechs. Actually, we studied one of your fintechs in my course. I'd love to come and talk to you about it. And, you know, it's because now you have that father, son, daughter, son or daughter, mother, you know, parent, child relationship as a junior to a senior staff. And it'll open up the door and you can approach people directly. Um, and the other thing is to do when, so when you do that research of that list, so if we just go through here, um, uh, let's just, I mean, you have to be with me on this if you want to make the list or not. And this is where I get a lot of pushback. So that's why I'm, I'm doing it, but let's just do the strategy firms. If you will, I can give you an example of how to do it. So a lot of people graduate from their MBA and they want to do two things with their life. God knows why. One is become a strategy consultant and two is, is do private equity. And they usually don't know too much about either, but they've been programmed in their MBA um, to do this. So here's a list of the strategy. These are like very common requests that I get. Shane, I want to be a strategy consultant. Shane, I want to be in private equity. And none of them make a list. So here's like basically like a little list of the strategy consulting firms. And actually, there's a ton more that you would also add to this list. Obviously, I can't put everybody on the slide. But you have a strategy firms which are like, you know, Miss Tala and Associates strategy consultants. So you have people who work five, 10 years in McKinsey. They've left. They started their own shop. And there's like four or five people working in their company. A lot of people graduate from a good school. They don't want to work in a small company, you know, Shane's strategy consultants, because there's only three staff. So they leave those people off the list. That's a big mistake. I just want you to list. This is how, how so you're asking me, you know, how do you get a meeting and how do you get around this online piece? This is a critical step in getting around that online whole piece, which is number one, who are the players? Who, who, who's my employer universe? And then uh, if we can get the, the next slide, um, you then make a list of what their revenue and what their staff is. Now, remember that the lower the staff number, the more likely they're hiring in a crisis. And the higher the staff number, the more likely they're laying off because as a big company, I'm spending 25% of my res resources in the future. Like, hey, we're going to make a fintech team or whatever. We're going to hire these people to fuel it. So I'm always overstaffing when I'm a large company because I'm. Oh, it seems we cut the connection. So we're just going to be back very soon with Shane once he's back.
Hi everyone, we're back. Shane, nice to have you back. <laughs> so let's continue our conversation. Um, you were telling us about how can someone book a meeting, uh, whether it's through the traditional ways of getting through a job portal or through an HR executive, or actually going straight to the CMO or someone with a decision-making power to actually get you to book an interview with them. Right, yeah. And just, Tori, I think somebody cut the power to my office. So uh, that was the reason why we got out there. So very unusual, uh, very unusual circumstance. So what we're talking about is, first of all, creating a power network. Where does power sit? It's the people. So let's identify all the power players in the market and let's identify all the possible employers and one of the things that we don't want to like most people will make a common mistake uh, for very small companies where there's only 10 staff or eight staff they tend to leave them off the list and so i'm just saying what we will be for the power cutout was that be cognizant that a small company of eight people is more likely in a crisis to be hiring than a large company because a large company always has a little bit of over capacity because they're building for the future um, you know, you'll be expanding, you'll be launching new products, new services. So you'll be constantly having a little bit of extra capacity in your team. And in a crisis, you say, oh, let's cut our future plans. Let's go back to our core. So they start laying off. Whereas a small company, they, they win two projects or they win a project, all of a sudden they're understaffed. So uh, small companies are almost always understaffed um, as they kind of struggle to grow. So uh, we were just on slide nine. I was going to say, just list out the companies, even if you are in marketing or whatever, even if you're not in a revenue perspective, just list the assets or list the revenue of the companies and the size of the companies and the staff. You can very easily get staff numbers from LinkedIn. Okay. So a lot of people who are not business people, um, you know, you're more kind of artsy people. They're like, whoa, numbers, Excel sheet, revenue. I'm out, I'm tuning out. Don't tune out, tune in, just it's not that hard. If you go on LinkedIn, you click people, it'll show you how many people are there. So you can use that as a number. It's obviously not perfect, it's mm -hmm. estimates. And then out of a, out of a, any industry, there's always eight or, eight or 10 companies which are publicly listed. You can get the revenue numbers from there. Then you can divide, I don't know if this is too much, but once you get the revenue and you have the staff, you just divide the revenue by the staff and then we get a number of revenue per full-time employee. So like in restaurant business, it's like $60,000, an average restaurant does $60,000 of revenue per employee. So right away, if your friend has a restaurant, your friend's not gonna tell you, oh, this is how much money I'm making. You can ask them how much staff you have and then they'll usually say, oh yeah, I have 20 staff. So right away, we have, we, we have an idea that you're probably making $2.4 million a year if you have 60 staff in your restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, now, some restaurants, of course, like Cheesecake Factory will be way above that number. They'll be doing like two fifty, dollars $300,000 per FTE and et cetera. So you have to then benchmark an average if you're a super top performer or you're an underperformer, where that number would be. And then so you make estimates and you just fill in the numbers. So what does this then tell you? It tells you two things. It's gonna tell you what the size of the market is. So you're entering into a market where, um, you know, your revenue is, you know, how much, how big is the, is the food and beverage market in, in Dubai, for example, you will figure this out. And then you start to say, and where the revenue is, is generally where the power sits. So um, obviously Emirates AD has a lot of power in the market. You're one of the biggest banks in the region and you affect a lot of things. You're an integral part of the economy. So there's a lot of power there. And then you have smaller banks. We don't need to name them, but they obviously will not have the same kind of influence and power that Emirates CD has. So we want to ask ourselves where the power sits, where's the revenue sit, how big are these companies? And this is just a basic analysis. So again, if people are following me, I know this seems like a kind of a long road, but this is how you get around applying online. So now that I don't know if I'm following you. 
the next question is how can you get them on the phone or how can you actually get their mobile number for example and what do you do there do you send them an email although it sounds like the answer is pretty obvious but can you send them a whatsapp is it considered professional unprofessional once you get their their mobile number or should an email do and keep it professional yes okay so this also goes into um your personality. Uh, so if you're naturally extroverted, um, you'll be very comfortable calling people up. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some people will not uh, be so excited about that. Um, but so yeah, if you want to just fast forward, how do you get their mobile number? Um, so there's a couple ways. Number one, you can call the company and ask, can I have mobile number of xyz now many times 80 percent of the time the person will say no especially i'll tell you some secret techniques now on how to do this okay but um don't hold this against me i probably shouldn't be giving you some of these tips i'm about to give you but so this is what you would do is so the first port of call is the gentleman way is the or, or uh, the lady version of a gentleman? I don't I don't know what that is. It's just a classy person way. Let's say is to call into the company and talk to the secretary of the switchboard and say, yeah, I would love to talk with Miss uh, Miss Tala, please. And then they'll say she's in a meeting or can I take a message? Obviously, they're not going to put you on most of the time. And I'll say, oh, no worries. I'm just uh, I'm just on the run. Would you be able to give me her mobile number? I'll just send her a WhatsApp. Do you have her mobile number, please? And I make sure that I ask a question like, do you have her mobile number, please? Some people will give it. 90% of the time, they won't. <clears throat> now, that's because that person is a trained gatekeeper. So one thing you can do is what we call, is called a bounce technique. Mm -hmm. Now, bounce technique means I'm bouncing off someone else to get to you. So I call into Emirates NBD switchboard. I don't know if I should be saying this publicly, but... So what I would then do is put a extension in. So the switchboard automatically pushes me to uh, somebody's extension. And then I would say, oh, hi, Mrs. Tala, how are you? Now, of course, that person then says, no, this is not Mrs. Tala. And I'll say, oh, can you put me through to Mrs. Tala, please? And she's like, oh, uh, let me just see. And then, then you say, oh, do you have her mobile number, by the way? Now, some companies, the mobile number is listed in the directory. And that person is not a trained gate gatekeeper. So they don't have any defense. So they just think they're doing a favor and connecting a friend with a friend. And they'll say, oh, yeah, her, her mobile number is blah, 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 blah. Now you have the mobile number. Now you can send a WhatsApp. You can send a video. You can call the person. That's one way. Another way, what's behind door number two? Door number two is technology. So we have uh, softwares, which are called uh, number book, uh, real caller. These are things you can go to Play Store, you can download, and when you open the, uh, I don't know if you want to see this, I really should not be showing this stuff publicly, but, you know, you asked, so I'm probably going to regret this. Where's my number book? So I'll just show you live if you want to see what it looks like. So this is the software, it's called Number Book, I don't know if you can see that, and then you go in and you just type the person's name in. And uh, it will come up and show their uh, their mobile number. And so there's two softwares there. Now, what's behind door number three? Do you, I'm going to keep going. Do you want me to keep going, or is it enough information? Do you want me to do another way? You want one more? Okay. So they say good things always come in threes, right? So uh, so behind door number three is there's uh, two softwares called Signal Hire and Musha. That you can that you that you add as a plugin into your LinkedIn, and then when I have your LinkedIn profile up, there's a little box you click it and it says reveal contact, and then the web crawler. If that mobile number of that person is listed anywhere on the web, the mobile number pops up, and oh, wow. so your mobile number could be on a Twitter feed. You might say, oh, give me a call. I mean, six years ago, you could have put it somewhere, anywhere. It popped mm -hmm. up. And we're talking like ministers, uh, very senior people, their mobile numbers show up for these softwares. So those are some of the things that we would do to get the mobile number. But what happens is 
you have the moral number, but who should you call? Exactly. And that's where is that's where um, we come in here. So if you can, if so, if you just quickly look at slide uh, ten, um, what happens there is we have a list of the companies by revenue. So right away, I need to know where does where is you know, I changed the names of the firm because I don't want to get sued, but it's thinly veiled. So we call them McClinsey and we call them Beantown or whatever. You know, we're not here to talk about these specific firms or make any statement about them. I'm here to talk about how do you get a meeting with someone. So as soon as I understand this, where this revenue split is, I, I all of a sudden realize that the best biggest projects are probably with two firms and two firms at 57% of the market. So then uh, I have an idea. So if we go to slide 12, this is slide 12. Now, this is what you would then do is you would make a list of all the people in the office. Yeah, you were on slide 12 and you went back. I think we're page 12 or whatever you wanna call it. The one where the list with the chart, there we go. So uh, when you look at this chart, you then list every single person in the office. And when we look at this, you start to say, okay, well, which person has the most power? I know this sounds a bit Machiavellian or whatever, but you know, you want to be careful. And why am I talking about this power thing? So, for example, um, you saw uh, a mechanical engineering company, for example, that makes steel. They have an electrical engineering department. And in fact, I don't know if you know this, but a steel plant uses more electricity than an entire city. So the power grid and the electrical engineering that goes on in a steel mill is very complex and it's pretty senior. Now, if I'm an electrical engineer and I take that job as the head engineer managing the power plant, the power plant for the steel plant is huge, but I killed my career, why? Because when you look at the power in a steel plant, it's all mechanical engineers. So the CEO will be a mechanical engineer. The chairman will be a mechanical engineer. The vice chairman will be a mechanical engineer. The, everybody's going to be a mechanical engineer. And so you have what's called the glass ceiling and your career, you're never going to, you're never going to be beyond managing that. You're, you're you know, 10 years, you'll still be in the same role. So we yeah. want to understand where does that power sit and align ourselves in a job at a company and under a leader that has the power because that's how we're gonna grow and develop ourselves. So it's not that we're power hungry Machiavellian maniacs, it's just that if we wanna manage our career successfully, we wanna be on a road, on a path that is gonna develop ourselves. And I always get pushed back. So I get pushed back on the list. And the second you start talking about power, power is a very taboo topic to talk about. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, when you look at any of the career programs out there, Nobody else talks about power. I'll just keep, do you want me to just give you another quick example of power? Or is it too much? No, you can go for another quick example before our- Another quick example. Let's take automotive industry, okay? So when you look at very smart Harvard MBA grads, these kids are smart. They're not really kids. They're in their early 20s when they finish their MBA at Harvard, but let's just say early career. So they will apply to Ford Motor Company but they won't just apply to Ford, they'll apply to a specific department. And which department is that? And why do they pick that department? They will pick, uh, and so just put that, on, give that example a hold, just, just percolate on which department they apply to. Now, when the same group of students apply to a German automotive company, they apply to a different department. So why is that and what's the difference? So in America, the power in an automotive company sits in finance. So most of the CEOs will be very financially literate. In a German automotive company, all the CEOs will come from engineering because they really pride themselves with German engineering, yada, yada. So junior candidates, entry level uh, students who are, of, you know, have high IQs, they will apply to the engineering department or the finance department because they know that the path to becoming the CEO runs through that vein. So it's also the same in banking, for example, very few of your, you know, for a universal bank, your CEO will generally come from the, from head of corporate banking or head of retail banking, depending on where the revenue sits. 
very few will come from wealth management or private banking. You, you start to you start to limit you 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 won't you won't usually pick it happens, but you won't usually pick your group CEO from that department. So that's what I'm saying is so when we look at this, we start to have the bios and we start to understand um, one person has oversight. So so Toby is really working on a regional level. Adam is looking at the Middle East family business practice, and Jennifer is looking at uh, organizational uh, and financial institutions. So I would assume that the person managing the family businesses has the power because, you know, in our region, 80% of all the GDP goes to family businesses. Uh, and so you probably want to talk to Adam as your first port of call. Right. Toby's also not a bad option, but Toby's working regionally, so he won't have deep relate. He, Adam has relationships, so Adam is your go-to guy, and and so on, so so forth. So then, once you call up Adam, because I did my research, I'll say, "Hey, Adam, I was just doing some research on the strategy firms. I saw that you and Bean Town, between the two of you, you guys have fifty-seven percent. I just want to congratulate you on a great market. By the way, I just saw your article." Uh, that was in Gulf Business. That was really nice. I'd love to just come and have a coffee with you and talk about the strategy business and what's happening in Saudi and where the future of this market is going. Are you free for a five-minute call? Now the guy goes, wow, you know who I am. You know my background. You know how much market share we have. You read my article. Okay, I'm, I'm interested just to have a quick chat with you. Versus... Now, what's the difference? Now, people are like, Shane, this is too much work. I don't want to do this. What's your other option? And what they will, what the other, what the candidates who aren't getting a job do, they won't do the list of the companies. They won't look at the revenue. They won't do the market research. They won't look at the power sits. They'll call up Adam or Toby and they'll say, hey, I'm looking for a job. I'd love to come and talk to you about my career. Well, what does Adam or Toby say then? No, sorry. I have five, other, I have five million other problems to deal with. I have fires, I have people quitting, I have accounts going up and fire. Like, why would I take a time out and talk about your career? Where, mm. Versus the other dialogue is, hey, I'm in the know. I know a lot about your industry. I'd love to come and share some insights with you about the research I've been doing and, and where the future revenue is for strategy for me. The other thing is that if you can always tie your dialogue into the bottom line result whether you're in the back office or middle office. If you're in IT, I'd love to come show you the three things now that uh, uh, companies in your segment are doing to reduce their working capital. I'd love to show you three technologies that are reducing fist costs by 10 to 15% within 90 days. You know, mm -hmm. boom. And when you make that call, who are you calling if you're in IT? Well, I want to call the company that has the biggest IT team. I want to call the company that has the biggest IT budget. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is where how you utilize power in your in your in your network i know that we're running out of time as we start late but let me just finish or just do one more quick slide before we close here if you can allow can i get slide hard luck number 13 here please if you can show that slide this is an amazing slide and it's just something that's very interesting to look at so when you make so what happens is when i make a list of the candidate universe so Emirates MBD is one of the biggest banks. It's the greatest bank. It's, it's diversified. It's also, you know, it's active in so many different countries. It's a great place to work. So that might be my dream job. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's, it's not necessary. It may not necessarily be hiring. And when you get down to the small companies, you know, some guy just started a fintech and he has 10 staff and he just got the contract to do the online credit analysis for you know, one of the big banks, he immediately needs to hire 20 people. So when you go in and the, the, where the jobs are in the market, it may not be where your dream job is. So you might have to take a job in a smaller company for the next two, three years as we walk through the crisis and then make the leap into your Emirates NBD or you know, the, big, the big boys, the big company. Unfortunately, maybe it seems that we've lost chain one more time. 
so this actually brings us to the end of our session. We really hope you found it informative. Pardon? Yes, you're back. I thought oh, we were. <laughs> oh, you lost that whole thing. I was having one of my best rants there. That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. So you we missed the whole thing. Few minutes. Just to conclude that question, we can go for a uh, Okay, so what I was just saying is that when you make a list of those companies, we're yeah. all applying to the Googles and the Emirates MBD because these are the big, great, sexy companies. But the small companies that only have, you know, five, six, seven, eight people, that guy's doing a fintech. He's doing credit analysis for the banks. He just got a contract. He needs to hire 20 people. So you're walking by that guy's office and you're like, oh, I would never work there. Well, guess what? He's the innovator. He's the disruptor. He's the, he's the person who's hiring. He's growing. He's profitable. He's got cash and he needs good people. So, so when you look at this uh, uh, employer universe and you list the companies, the top hundred companies to the smallest, the biggest to the smallest, go to the smallest first. That's the biggest piece of advice is one, make your list, go to the smallest first, and then be informed when you call up that person who's only running eight person company, go, hey, I love your company. You guys are doing this. I saw what your service was. I saw your article in the magazine. I just checked out your LinkedIn. I saw you went to Concordia. Can I come by? I'd love to talk to you. Can I talk? Can I come and see you at one o'clock tomorrow? Mm -hmm. The guys, person or the lady, the people are going to say yes, especially the smaller the company is. The more interested they are, they're like, you know how hard it is? He doesn't have a budget to take job ads. He doesn't have a budget to go, you know, he's trying to hire through his network and he, and, and they're struggling to find good people. So he'd be like, yes, please come in. I will, you know, hey, this guy called me yesterday. You're going to tell his partners, oh, he knows the market. They're coming in tomorrow at one. Maybe, maybe that's the person we can hire. That job's waiting for you. There's tons of jobs in the market, but you just don't see them and they're not going to be online ads. You got to do the list, please. It's a bit of a personal effort, but it goes a long way. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a more work. They don't want to do it. So yeah, that's very true. Shane, thank you so much. This was such an informative session, and I hope that our viewers got uh, got to also learn the tips and tricks of how to get uh, an interview or a meeting with a person in a company. Uh, we hope you found it very informational, very uh, very informative, very uh, educational. Stay tuned for our last episode on career management in the next coming weeks. Shane, thank you so much. Once again, I'd just like to say Shane is a career is a career coach and he's the CEO of the management consultancy, the Phillips Group. Sure. Can I just say that we actually have four more, I think, because there was some scheduling issue. There's actually four more coming. So we'll be live unless I, for what I understand, in September there. There is. So thanks. And we made it through a blackout and technical issues. We had so many challenges today. So sorry for the, for the audience, but thanks for having me. We really apologize. It's not been our day with technology, but hopefully. But the good thing is you can always watch it on IGTV later on. So that's the good part. So anyways, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Shane, so much for being with us. And uh, stay tuned for our next session. And until then, we hope you stay safe. And you stay healthy and hope you have a wonderful day. Masalama. <laughs>